is now broadcasting. I can take it, we're on air now, so we might just as well get going. Um, welcome to everybody who has tuned in on us today um, to EURAC's third webinar, this time titled Minorities, Territorial Governments and Interstate Relations in Pandemic Times, obviously to do with, with COVID-19. COVID let me introduce to everybody the, the panelists we have today. First of all, we have uh, Zia Spiliopoulos um, Ockermark from the Arland Island um, Peace Institute, Francesco Palermo from the Institute for Comparative Federalism here in Eurac in, in Bozen, and my colleague Sergio Constantin from the, in, <laughs> from the Minority Rights Institute in, uh, in the Eurac. My name is Georg Grote, I'm a historian also attached to the Minority Institutes here in the Eurac. The way we're going to run it today is that I open the discussion or I open, open this webinar by asking our three panelists to give us a kind of a five minute, three to five minute introduction uh, into their interest in the particular topic and uh, the, the kind of points they would like to raise. And then we'll open the discussion, we'll ask everybody who, um, who is listening, who is watching us to su submit questions. Our colleague, um, Alexandra Tomaselli, she's going to co collate these and she's going to pass them on to me and I'll try to weave them into our conversation as we go along. I expect the whole webinar to last for about an hour and um, hope that you will enjoy today's webinar. Can I first of all ask Sia to give us her point of view from the Orland Islands, the Peace Institute on the Orland Islands. Yes. Minorities, territorial governance and interstate relations in pandemic times. Yes, thank you very much. The Orland Islands, which have been a, a quarantine minority in a sense for quite some time. This week, it's the first week since mid-March that the ferries are starting to go uh, to the west. So uh, this is a, an, an interesting time in, in many ways, also on the Orland Islands. We have seen a, a tripling of unemployment. So this hits also regions which are considered economically well-developed. Um, and we can see already at this point, the difference to the mainland where we have a doubling of unemployment. So I find this interesting um, following on the points made earlier on webinar one and two about the different effects of the measures and of the pandemic in different um, regions and for different groups. And I think one of my key points is going to be about the need for differentiated solutions. But before going to that, I would like to um, address um, the issue of the rhetoric of war, which I think has been quite prominent uh, in along all the, the two and a half months um, that we have been following until now. Uh, not only um, President Macron, but also many also local politicians and public figures have used the rhetoric of war. We are on war against the virus, even though the virus is not even a living thing with uh, a, an intention and a, a purposeful action, uh, which means that we have to be in a state of emergency which implies that we have to uh, be loyal to this effort, the war effort, and questions of dissent are rather problematic. I believe that this is, first of all, a mental state of emergency before being a legal state of emergency. And we will return to the legal aspects of the state of emergency, I believe, later on. As I'm a lawyer, I will choose this as my main perspective. But the mental state of emergency is very problematic because it begs the question, who is then to be defeated? Are the defeated those who are dead, the 350,000 around the world until now? Are the defeated the states that have most citizens deceased and which are to be put in a corner? This uh, deteriorates interstate relations and we have already seen this um, as countries compare them themselves constantly. We have seen that also in the Nordic relations there has been a deterioration uh, and there are many reasons for that. 
So are these countries to be the defeated? They are to be kept away. They have most of the problems and the problems are so greater somewhere else than where we are. Uh, or are the defeated the millions of people that are going to be af uh, um, affected by the economic effects? So this is a, a highly problematic state of mind, which not only then begs for our loyalty and our comparative um, mentality, we are better, there are others with problems, but it also makes us more tolerant to the limitations of our own rights. And we have seen it here. I thought I, I can expand on it a, a little bit later, but in particular with regard to the move, freedom of movement, I find some of the measures introduced very problematic, at least from the perspective of the Finnish legislation, but also in the intersection between the competencies of the Åland Islands um, auto autonomy and the uh, competencies of the state. But we accept it. We want our states to be action oriented, to deal properly and forcefully with the enemy. Um, so this was the first point, uh, the war rhetoric, which I think is um, continuing. And um, just to show a, a rather sad but somewhat funny uh, article that will appear tomorrow in the uh, newspaper, the Swedish speaking newspaper, the article uh, title is in war and pandemics, everything is allowed. And it has to do with the exceptions made to experiments for, um, for producing a new vaccine, uh, experiments that are, uh, uh, and re legislation that is supposed to protect both animals and humans from being subjected to experiments that have not been <coughs> sufficiently tested. And now we see that this infatuation and market run towards the new vaccine makes us accept, in some countries at least, um, deviations from rules that we thought were very well established. So it's in many different fields that this has long-term effects, not only what we immediately think about wearing the mask or going out from the lockdown. Yeah. Uh, so the second point, very briefly, just to introduce it, is the issue of multi-level governance and the way regions, centers and peripheries are realigned in this um, situation. And if I'd say overall, from a northern perspective, we have seen that uh, local governments and territorial autonomies are indeed loyal with their governments they follow the decisions taken and they were quite passive and taken aback, if I would simplify it, in the initial stages of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There are some uh, more recent exceptions. We see, for example, how Northern Ireland is uh, showing uh, activity in creating its own program in dealing with the pandemic. We see here in the north how the Faroe Islands have been very active in introducing their own um, uh, project around the, the pandemic. But in the Orland case, legislation has in the, in the Finnish uh, parliament has not even mentioned the shared competencies and the legislation in the Orlan Islands uh, concerning some of the uh, areas affected, namely health, education, but also local uh, communications. So we see indeed some centralization. One of the questions uh, in the last webinar was, is there a centralization? Yes, I do see a centralization, um, but I think there is also a counter a counter movement taking, forming itself at the moment. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sia. I think you raised a couple of very interesting points that we're definitely going to come back to. I want to pass on to, to Francesca now. Um, do we see centralization, Francesca? What do you think? <laughs> 
Well, uh, thank you first for uh, having me in this webinar. Um, I'll come to that point uh, at the end. Um, even though I see, uh, I agree with Sia, I'm, there is um, certainly centralization, but also there is a lot uh, that speaks for a decentralization. But so let me develop that uh, argument later on. Um, I would say that in general, what we are seeing with this pandemic is that it has been a sort of an accelerator of society. Um, so it has made all the inequalities that were already there simply worse and more visible. And I mean uh, social inequalities, uh, economic inequalities, territorial inequalities as well. Um, so um, the impact on minorities, uh, after all, has been extremely asymmetric, very, very different. Uh, the minorities that were good off uh, are even perhaps in a stronger position than they uh, used to be. And those that were more marginalized, you know, got extremely marginalized. I know we are going to talk about Roma perhaps uh, uh, later on uh, as a, an outstanding example and very sad example. So um, that's the first element, the acceleration of dynamics that are already present in society. The second one is uh, the um, response that has been that of nation states. And Sia has put it uh, very, very nicely, speaking about the war rhetoric. And who is the subject when you go to war? Is the state, right? Who is the subject uh, you are dying for? The nation state. Um, and therefore, uh, this has had a very, very a negative impact on all of the rhetoric, and I don't want to uh, uh, repeat what Sia has already said. Um, that has also, uh, you know, in a way, affected minorities proportional to their feeling as a nation. So uh, when it comes to uh, staying together, to uh, aligning, then of course you look at your community. Your community can be that of the nation state, but can also be that of the minority when the minorities compact, strong, etc., etc. So we have seen clearly very strong signs of minority nationalism where minority nationalism is strong. Um, and the last initial point uh, I want to make is about, you know, the territories and uh, the territorial conflicts between, let's call them minority autonomous regions and the central governments. Um, I recently read um, something which is making the headline in Spain uh, the um, a statement by the Prime Minister of the Valencian uh, community, Mr. Puig, who said that uh, uh, loyalty doesn't mean submission. Um, also expressing the frustration uh, of uh, the uh, territorial self-governments being uh, pushed uh, in a corner by the intervention of the central government, by the centralization. But this is exactly the point I want to make, and then I stop here. Uh, and I hope we can develop it further on in our discussion, uh, which is, um, I believe the centralization is just on the surface, or better, just in the very initial stage of the emergency. And here you don't see any difference between uh, federal states uh, um, or decentralized states or even unitary states. The um, trend has been the same, um, shifting the power from territories to the center and at the central level for, from parliament to government. That's, you know, everywhere the same. The difference is about uh, the nuances that need to come in at some point. And we are in this stage everywhere in Europe now. Um, there, there is where actually there is a lot of space for regions. There is where every place, including very centralized countries, think of France, uh, are introducing differentiated rules. But nevertheless, uh, despite the fact that the role of the regions uh, is actually growing and is of uh, extreme importance in that debate, this is uh, kind of overshadowed by the rhetoric of the national response. So again, the uh, fear of having asymmetric solutions. Why should we be treated differently? Why should we have different uh, uh, health care systems, which is actually what is uh, existing in practice uh, nearly everywhere. But when it comes to the rhetoric of fear, then of course you have to come up with unitary 
heter uniform solutions. And this is a problem in terms of uh, not what is happening, because the reality is exactly the opposite, but what is perceived. And I think uh, this is where SIA is very, very uh, right uh, in, uh, you know, framing that into the rhetoric of, uh, of war. Um, I would very much like to go into uh, these points more deeper when we continue our discussion, but I'll stop here for the initial statement. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks for, for, for a couple of very good points, particularly this, this acceleration of society, that, there, that COVID has acted as a bit of a catalyst for developments that have already been there sort of under the surface. Can I pass that on to you, Sergio? Can you deal some with, 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 with this term? Yes, uh, thanks, Georg. And uh, well, also, uh, I want to, to thank to, to the whole team of the Institute for Minority Rights, uh, who is behind this, this web series. I think uh, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, I think I also learned a lot myself in uh, listening to the, uh, watching the last uh, two episodes. And I see, I think, already a kind of fil rouge emerging here, because Francesco mentioned now this, this accelerator of society. And then in the first um, episode, one of the speakers uh, made this, uh, used this figure of speech and uh, um, compared uh, the coronavirus crisis with an X-ray, which basically uh, highlights or makes very visible uh, both the strengths and the weaknesses of our societies, of the states in general, you know. And then in the second episode, uh, one of the participants, one of the speakers, um, uh, pointed out clearly this, uh, how the, the, um, this entrenched inequality and uh, structural discrimination affects or aggravates, in fact, the situation, already a uh, bad situation of uh, my certain minority groups or vulnerable uh, groups. And uh, I think I, this is a good, uh, uh, let's say, uh, point to start our discussion today because um, I'm thinking about trying to somehow, somehow uh, summing up all this uh, dynamics that we, we witness if we use this kind of figure of speech of the X-ray of the society of Europe, because it's also very useful in the sense that you can zoom in and zoom out. So. Um, you can uh, look at the, the big picture and also to, to have a kind of overall European uh, perspective, but you can also then zoom in and uh, look uh, deeper into the situation of minority communities at uh, the regional level or even at local level you know, to see uh, how the, and what is different in terms of impact, impact on this, these communities. And um, if we use this, you now make this kind of exercise of imagination, I think um, what emerged at least uh, initially was a kind of um, a first kick in reaction of our societal immune system. So initially it was a kind of feeling of solidarity. There were these kind of calls or offers for help at all levels, individuals, communities, states, at a super state level as well. But then uh, quite fast you could see already a change, I think, and then things start to be more nuanced and then in fact started to change in the sense that uh, what it seems to happen is that this coronavirus uh, woke up some older virus, this kind of uh, man-made viruses. Of course, I'm speaking about nationalism and racism. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it seems that uh, our antibodies are starting to diminish. We are, we are not, uh, I mean, we are not immune against these this, uh, man-made viruses. And um, then, uh, yeah, if you, if you use this kind of uh, no x-raying and try to see what happens across Europe and then look at the big picture, you see that there are clearly some, some, uh, some damage done across Europe because there are certain uh, minority issues which are uh, of uh, European relevance. Uh, the, the case of Roma was uh, mentioned several times also in the past episodes, also today, probably we'll discuss it also today. And there are also other vulnerable groups that are affected across Europe. And then, uh, of course, there are also issues, minority issues, which are relevant um, for minorities across the continent. Now, uh, uh, it was already mentioned that uh, the use of minority languages or, uh, in fact, the lack of use of minority languages uh, when uh, communicating with vital information regarding the, the coronavirus uh, crisis and so on and so forth. And also to mention another example, the situation of minorities living in border areas. Now borders are again uh, very important, suddenly are very relevant and um, minorities who uh, used to, to uh, basically uh, have no problem in, in moving across the border because there were no borders, now suddenly find themselves cut off from uh, uh, what would be maybe the kin on the other side of the border and so on and so forth. So this is what you could see at the macro level, at the European level. But then if you zoom in, 
you notice something that Francesco already mentioned and also Sia, the fact that um, you have this kind of tension, this inflammation in this area of contact between the level of government, in between central governments and autonomous regions, and especially relevant when uh, autonomous regions have also an important significant minority population. And, um, and then uh, as well, a third zooming in, and I mean, the first, the second one, this one about minorities and autonomies, is mostly, uh, you see that is mostly uh, occurring in Western Europe because in Western Europe, you have uh, most of the autonomous arrangements. Uh, and uh, this is territorial autonomous arrangement. While in the East European, you don't have this kind of, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, level of governance. Uh, and then you have a different kind of dynamic there. Then you move to the third kind of zooming in, and then you see that there are again tensions and uh, a lot of inflammation in these uh, areas of, let's say, we can call them uh, old traumas, old historical traumas, of, uh, or even probably um, uh, wounds or new wounds that uh, deep wounds that uh, never never healed, let's say. And uh, if uh, some of you or some of the participants follow what what happened in Eastern Europe in the last couple of months, especially in, in terms of relation between uh, let's say Hungary and Romania, uh, this is quite astonishing. Let's say this this uh, couple of months would be like a roller coaster in terms of relations between the two states and in terms of relation between uh, majority and minority. And this kind of rhetoric that you could hear now in, uh, in this part of the world, uh, in, many, in many cases you didn't hear uh, since in the 90s basically. So uh, I would uh, basically um, stop here and uh, I think we can start a discussion from here and maybe during the discussion we can also uh, now look into more details and discuss exactly uh, this kind of concrete examples of, of uh, how the, the coronavirus impacts on the minority communities, on the relation between majority and minority, and also into, in, into relation between the states as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, the three of you. And it's very interesting that you make that point, um, Sergio, because questions are already coming in on that particular issue. Um, I like the, very much like the idea of the X-ray that you, that you mentioned. Um, again, it seems that in this crisis, um, individuals and societies are going back to type, they're reverting back to type. We've seen a couple of knee-jerk reactions like the closing of borders all over Europe, which were kind of instinctive, almost panic-like, completely against the European, um, European sense of, of, of community. We have seen individual examples, for example, here in, in, um, in, in South Rural, where, where I live, where local carabiniere um, sort of almost suppress people who want to want to go out where you have the central states the organs of the central state uh, against the, the the autonomous province and individuals of the autonomous province we have seen people blackmailing each other for violating the the lockdown and so on so on a lot of levels we see a re reverting to type the veneer of of civilization seems to be going very very quickly in these kinds uh, in these kinds of of chaos and as a as a as a um, as, a, as a minority, um, the German-speaking minority in, in, in northern Italy, um, we're very much ex experiencing now this a, a very strange relationship with the old kin state with, with Austria because they're keeping their borders closed, and the, the euro region is going through a bit of a crisis at the moment um, because it seems completely invalid at this stage. I, let me let me. Um, connect with the question that has just come in, that question on the closed borders. Um, while national minorities that have normally been very peaceful are occasionally mobilizing against their kin governments because they feel completely neglected, something that certainly is being felt in, in the South Tyrol. Ex experts are saying that this may damage the relationship between kin minorities and kin states for some time in the future. Would you have any, any view on that, the three of you, on that question that has just come in? Well, Perhaps I, I can start from up in the north. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we are in, in the reversed position here, yes, because uh, you are closed off from the Austrian side. Uh, for the Hollandic case, it is not Sweden that is closing the borders, it is uh, Finland that is closing the borders, so you can find either of these situations, yes. What I think is um, uh, to link back to this issue of diversifications needed, part of this state mindset, the emphasis on the central government was the inability originally of designing regional and group specific responses. 
So we have seen it. The, I, I would like to comment on the Swedish case because Sweden is very much debated on its policies. And I think it is so correct of Sergio to use the X-ray uh, parallel because the Swedish case does not show any deficiencies in the management of the disease and the pandemic. The deficiencies are in the management of the suburbs of Stockholm that have been hit doubly as strong, uh, where you have many migrant uh, minorities and you have people who uh, live under dire economic conditions, mm. one. And the second one, it is a failure of the elderly care system, which has been highly fragmentized and which has not taken uh, any uh, possibility of actually dealing with the dangers for, for the pandemic. So what you have here is not the problem of the pandemic. It, it is just accentuated by the pandemic, the failure of existing systems. And public health has not been a very hot and sexy topic for a very long time. Public health has not been widely debated in minority discourses. Uh, as we know, there are very few countries with specific minority um, targeting policies in public health systems. So no wonder that this is happening. And for that reason, I think that we, are now um, starting seeing that there is a push for diversification. We have seen it at least in some ways, perhaps not uh, only positive ways, but not closing entire, uh, uh, entirely uh, lockdown in Finland, but only the capital uh, city, for instance. And I think um, Part of the mindset problem was that until 2019, we have all been thinking of um, uh, state of emergency in terms of war and in terms of interstate conflict, possibly terrorism. Yeah. So we have not created the systems to deal with these, I would call them civilian pandemics. And if anything i'm i'm happy that this happens now because it's bound to be even more acute in ecological collapse situations mm -hmm. is this a kind of a dry run for something worse to come you think well uh, we we know that the Olan islands had a horrible storm uh, but it was the only region in finland to be hit in January 2019. At that point, the Olan government had to deal with it on its own. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be likely other conditions where we will need to have similar uh, systems in place. Mm -hmm. However, you were mentioning earlier on the rise of the rhetoric language and the war kind of war, war type, type language. That goes hand in hand with uh, sort of a giving of civic rights that we had to do. I mean, I have never stayed in, in an apartment for, for seven weeks at a time, but I was asked to, and this was enforced. So that's something completely new to me. I was literally stripped of all my, my, my rights. Somebody was pointing out that this kind of, that extremists on the political left and the political right are using all of this and they're sp now spearheading movements um, for sort of more civic rights. Well, the, the, the contributor mentioned Vox in Spain or the AfD in Germany um, that, um, that are sort of cap capitalizing on the loss of civic rights during this pandemic in order to drive their, their nationalist rhetoric. Is there a danger there? Well, a concrete example, then I'll leave uh, the floor for Francesco and Sergio, but a concrete example, I have had my mother uh, uh, ill in Stockholm, so I have had to travel in mid-March uh, to Stockholm to assist her. Um, and at that time, uh, that is uh, the four, the, I uh, traveled on the 10th of March, on the 14th of March, I received in my very old fashioned mobile, a text from the government of Finland saying, you have to stay at home when you return for 14 days, not go to work. This was three days before the announcement of the measures by the government, before the passing of the bill under the constitution of Finland, 
concerning the closing of the border, which means that my mobile phone company, alternatively my ferry company, has shared my details with the government at the time where formally there is no state of emergency. And of course, if I were an Uyghur person in China, I would be highly disturbed. And I am disturbed at the principal level, even though, of course, I know that the, the Finnish state does not um, persecute Swedish speakers. Yes, at the principal legal level, this is an unacceptable movement. And I, I keep this uh, message in my phone as a memory of these uh, very uh, strange days. But in strange days, people are killed. We know that political opposition is targeted in, in strange days. We have seen that in, in communist Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, and, and we have seen it in many other places of the world. We see it in Hong Kong perhaps today. May I continue from one from where Sia has stopped? Uh, let me continue first on the rights issue, and then I want to zoom in into the territorial relations again. Um, there has been um, also a call from uh, the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union, essentially saying, well, uh, are we sure, now I'm translating and uh, popularizing it, but are we sure that the fundamental rights culture uh, has sufficient roots in our societies. Mm -hmm. We believe that uh, Europe especially is uh, um, constructed on the culture of liberty and fundamental rights, but to see how easily people um, have um, you know, uh, been ready to give up their rights uh, for right or wrong, I mean, I'm not entering into that debate, perhaps it was for right, but still, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, people were principally not so much disturbed by the provisions, by the measures, by the fact that they had to give up their rights, uh, based very often on a very um, slippery, uncertain uh, legal basis, I mean, this has not been questioned except from, you know, some uh, uh, legal freaks and uh, people uh, who are, um, you know, dealing with these issues professionally. Mm -hmm. But overall, the population uh, has been uh, absolutely, you know, uh, unaffected by the fact that, you know, their rights could be stripped. Uh, if that happens, then of course it can be for good reasons, and I'm pretty sure that uh, it is the case everywhere in Europe, more or less, uh, in these days. But still, we are vulnerable. This makes societies extremely fragile, because fundamental rights only exist if they have roots, if they are lived, if they are perceived by people. Otherwise, they remain just on paper, and they uh, have very, very little impact. And this is something that, again, with all due distinctions, of course, uh, we have experienced in Europe, not our generation, but the previous generations did. Uh, you know, something is happening, uh, okay, it's happening for the good. Perhaps there will be a good reason for that. There will be a good reason to exterminate the Jews at some point, right? I mean, step by step, you'd never know where it ends up. But it's extremely dangerous in a way. So um, my big worry is about the real uh, penetration of culture uh, of fundamental rights. The other point I want to make, uh, and uh, let me use the metaphor of zooming in and zooming out, uh, as we are uh, on Zoom platform also, um, is uh, what, um, what we mentioned about the borders. Um, of course, at the first glance, borders were erected again um, and that was uh, used and possibly misused by the uh, extremist rhetoric, um, including uh, in many minority communities uh, in terms of not putting the border into question, but just the fact that are we on the right or, or, or on the wrong side of the border? I mean, this is exactly the same reasoning. Um, but if you zoom in a little bit and see uh, a little bit under the surface, then uh, actually things work better than you may think. 
just because uh, what is being told is that the state is what matters doesn't mean that this is really reflecting the reality. Let me make an example of here of, of South Tyrol, where again, of course, the border is a very sensitive issue, obviously. Um, well, in the end, um, it has kind of worked. Uh, students, uh, there are many, many uh, South Tyrolian students um, in Austrian universities and especially in the University of Innsbruck, they are allowed to travel and they are allowed to go uh, back to Innsbruck and take their exams. Uh, the import of masks uh, from, Aust from China actually via Austria has worked well and also the rest of Italy has benefited from that. Um, so what is the, the real problem is in the very moment is tourism, right? Um, and uh, this has an impact uh, in a touristic region uh, this one. But again, we should put things into the context. So what is really wrong with uh, the relations? Not so much, except for some uh, statements by some politicians, but you know, in two days they are gone. Um, the problem is, uh, and, and the same, I would say, it's also working with uh, regard to Italy, um, because um, initially uh, South Italian, uh, South Italian government has uh, uh, kind of accepted uh, the measures taken by uh, the national government um, and then at some point they just decided to force a little bit the uh, easing of the measures, uh, adopting a law that was contested but not so much in the end and it seems to be working. So in fact it has prompted also uh, the reaction by other regions that have followed suit. So not bad at all actually, perhaps again an example of uh, uh, the so-called laboratory federalism, the fact that if you start uh, something in a territory can also become a very good practice for other territories. The problem is the uniform approach. Um, and this is what the national rhetoric is very much using, uh, including the Austrian government saying, okay, no, we cannot uh, open the uh, borders to Italy because Italy is still uh, impact. Well, the problem is that uh, it, it only affects one region and the whole lockdown uh, in the country overall has been because of one region, uh, the region around Milan, Lombardy, uh, which is important, which has been dramatically affected, but it was essentially one region. Um, is it correct to uh, close down uh, an entire country to block the economy everywhere for uh, just one region um, where perhaps uh, some stronger measures would have been beneficial. And then we, when you have to find a, a national uniform solution, then you find a sort of a common denominator, which is too much for certain territories and too little for other territories. Again, uh, I want to make the case for diversification of solutions, which I think uh, governments tend not to see enough. I think you made a very, very good point in, in, in pointing out our situation here and saying it's not all that bad. I mean, maybe we should in our discussion also consider those groups, those minorities that are stateless. For example, we have heard very, very little of the Roma plight at the moment. We don't know how the Uyghurs are doing in China and we have no idea what's happened to the Kurds in, in, uh, in Turkey at the moment, do we? Well, if, if nobody is taking the floor, just nobody is uh, taking the floor. No, a no, very no. short comment on that. Well, just very short comment on that. Um, when we speak about minorities, again, minorities help us to differentiate, and we need to uh, see things in context. Not all minorities are the same, and uh, I, we are living in a relatively lucky minority territory, and I think we should uh, care much more uh, about the minorities that are really very, very, in a very, very difficult situation, uh, such as those that you have mentioned, and uh, more attention should be devoted to them. May, may I jump in? Uh, Please. Okay, so first, I, I'd like to say a few words about the previous question uh, regarding bo the borders and how uh, this might affect or not the, the relations between uh, uh, minorities and the kin state. And, um, well, I mean, if you look at a bit what happened in several countries, you'll see that uh, also Francesco said that the situation in the end uh, somehow was not as bad as it seems initially. 
uh, in some cases, states uh, manage to find the compromise. And I mean, again, I would give the example of Romania and Hungary because, uh, in fact, the relations started at the beginning of the crisis uh, started quite well. Initially, the border was closed, but then um, the two states uh, reached an agreement and they opened the border for the um, communities living uh, at a certain range uh, along the border. So uh, to not affect those who are basically there and to, to basically and that are living uh, crossing the border every day. And this agreement was also facilitated by the um, uh, party representing the interest of Hungarian minority in Romania. So it was basically yeah, an example of good practice, I would say, and how to, to solve uh, this kind of situation. And then other, other states had um, uh, made this kind of differential approach that Francesco also mentioned in the sense that uh, they didn't close all borders. Uh, they just look at the situation and then uh, took decision based on, on the specific uh, case. And uh, it comes to my mind, for example, Germany, uh, the German-Danish border was closed, but the German-Belgian border was not closed. So. Uh, members of the German-speaking community in Belgium could uh, simply continue with their lives. Most, many of them probably also work uh, in Germany, so this, this was uh, never a, a problem for them. And uh, uh, the German authorities uh, assessed the situation, considered that, uh, in fact, uh, the German-Danish border must be closed, which, of course, had an impact on the minorities living in Schleswig-Holstein and uh, South Jutland. So, you see, and just to, to end this, this point, I would say that, well, um, um, that whether the relations or not will be damaged, I think it depends very much on the situation of the minority itself. Because if you have these cases or minorities are basically dependent on their kin states, they don't, they cannot afford to damage the relation with the with the kin state. And it's also maybe this is a consequence of I think um, a wrong kind of policy of the, the states where the minority lives. Uh, in the sense that uh, they, they tend to outsource the protection of minorities, for example, in terms of uh, providing education, the mother tongue and so on and so forth to the kin state. And then this creates a kind of dependence uh, between the, the minority and the kin state. And in this kind of situation, then the minorities simply have to, 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 to uh, accept and uh, to, to uh, go, go forward because there's no other way that they will uh, ruin the relations with their the state. I think you see, I want to, you want to, jo to join, uh, to say something well, here now? I, I would like to unite the point uh, made by you, Sergio, about outsourcing and kin states and the point made by Francesco earlier about um, how we deal with health si systems in the future and, and kind of thinking ahead and the diversifications needed. Uh, because on the one hand, there is the danger if, if there is a, a true outsourcing saying I have no responsibility and someone else should take care of this particular group and uh, border minorities are very vulnerable to such situations at the time when borders are closed which is something that we saw here. Also, with regard to the local hospital and, and the existence of enough um, doctors who are otherwise commuting, and it was originally not possible to, f to find a solution, um, even though we have Nordic cooperation. So I think that this type of crisis forces cooperation to deal Nordic cooperation, for instance, to deal with this type of problems and coordination between health systems across borders. So this is something positive. And I also note that the European uh, dimension, uh, we could perhaps continue a little bit further into this uh, European dimension. Um, the European uh, Centre on uh, Disease um, uh, Management, which is, uh, by the way, situated in Stockholm, has a very, very limited mandate for coordination. It is uh, a technical agency of the European Union and has not had any powers, it has not been given any powers to coordinate in any way these things. So in, instead of, of um, using international organizations as an easy uh, bashing object, we should say, what do our states actually want? What do we as citizens want in terms of coordination in these fields? Uh, and, there, and there are very many good uh, opportunities and possibilities uh, uh, and eventually the issue of the medical professionals was solved. So it's a good, it's a good solution where things actually worked uh, eventually. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but I wanted also to mention the role of the World Health Organ Organization and to think ahead, what do we really need about diversification and sub-state coordination in this field? 
the reporting of the World Health Organization on the disease does not only cover na nation states. There is a subheading in the reporting about territories. These territories are very limited and we can perhaps discuss some other times why these particular territories are reported separately. But you can find the Faroe Islands in Greenland, you can find Kosovo and the Isle of Man and Gibraltar and several other such territories there. You can also find New Caledonia uh, as well as the, the Occupied yeah. Palestine Authority in the reporting of the World Health Organization. So there is a certain opening in showing these different diversified situation and I think that what is happening at this moment also when, when mayors and uh, urban centers are very dynamic in their cooperation, as we have seen it in Central Europe, that we have different modes of um, action also at this interstate level. And uh, so I see many opportunities. I'm not only pessimistic about what is happening, even though it has costed uh, the lives of, of uh, hundreds of thousands, the, there is an interesting move away from the nation state at the moment because it is very, very different. If you live in Stockholm or you live in, in the southern border, if you live on the Åland Islands, or as a friend of uh, mine who speaks me and Kelly in the north of of uh, Sweden said, we have a square kilometer for each person. We don't need any social distancing. <laughs> so, so it is clear that these, uh, these are um, knowledges and, and input that comes from, from um, national minorities too. I think that's very, very good that you highlighted that point. It's a very, very positive note as well. You mentioned the European dimension as well, and the and the sort of the principle of subsidiarity was kind of in in the background too to what you what you've just said. Um, can I basically sort of from 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 our present position sort of focus slightly in the in, into the future and pose the question to all three of you? Where are we going to be, particularly in the in the relationship between the regions, um, the sub-state entities, the European na nation states, and the the supranational organizations such as the WHO? Because um, as, as somebody who is who is very much in favor of, uh, of of regions and federalism and all that, I could recently sort of observe two completely different ways of federalism being exercised, comparing um, Italy, which be suddenly became very centralistic, and Germany, which suddenly became very federal, and Chancellor Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, Merkel losing out to the federal states in a way. So, where is the future in this in this kind of um, the, talk of war almost between the sub-state, the state, and the super-state organizations. Francesco, would you like to take that bait? Thank you for asking the most difficult question. <laughs> um, well, I think we will have to see things in a longer perspective. Um, for the time being, um, the situation might not uh, look uh, very rosy in terms of acknowledging the need for differentiation, that we are uh, all on the same line here uh, by advocating more nuanced and more differentiated approaches. This is not the prevailing uh, line at the moment, but in a longer term, uh, I think uh, the important things will come up. Um, you can take the same uh, sort of perspective when looking at the role of the European Union. Part of the rhetoric has been of Europe is completely absent. What is the European Union for if they do not, you know, um, resolve a problem of a pandemic? Whereas at the same time, of course, there is, um, you know, a call for a nationalized uh, unitary healthcare system. I mean, how do these two things go together is completely mysterious. But again, uh, today uh, there is an important uh, meeting uh, uh, in the European Council and we'll see uh, that actually a lot of completely unprecedented measures are being taken. Some countries might not be at completely happy, some others might be disappointed. You have to compromise. This is the essence of 
federalism in general, including the European Union. You have to compromise and sometimes the compromise might be more or less beneficial. But uh, it is completely wrong to say that there is no role for the European Union. The same thing is happening with regard to regions. Um, actually, uh, looking comparatively at uh, the reaction by federal states to the pandemic, um, one notes that um, the federal states overall have uh, used emergency powers much, much less than unitary states. And this, I think, tells something. I mean, the emergency was there. But uh, normally, if you have a differentiated structure, if you have a pluralistic structure, this helps you overcome the problems without using emergency powers. Mm -hmm. So emergency powers are being used much more frequently in unitary states. I think this tells us something about the possible trajectory. Um, of course, what is needed is a sort of a process of awareness of this phenomenon which is, uh, for the time being, relatively difficult to see. But I, my guess is, um, I would be also a little optimistic and think that uh, when the emergency is over, um, some rational thinking will uh, establish itself. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Sergio, Sergio, do you want to come in on this? Yes. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, well point out the fact that I think we all agree that this this crisis is a kind of moment of rupture. You know? so uh, definitely, you know, uh, some things will change, will have to change, and uh, I think one of the uh, possible, hopefully, outcomes will be that we will need basically to uh, update and upgrade our toolbox of dealing with minority issues. Um, I mean, the 90s, late, late 89, no, was one of the moments. And the 90s was the, the moment of Council of Europe, you know, the setting of minority standards and uh, the, the two main conventions and so on and so forth. And uh, I think what you could uh, see uh, among, at least not all minorities, but among certain minorities, uh, strong, politically motivated, uh, mobilized minorities, is that there's a kind of sense of fatigue with the, with the situation when it comes to the standards and the implementation and so on and so forth. They want something more. And the new next step, logical step, would be, of course, developments within the European Union. So if the 90s was the, the period of Council of Europe, the 2020s should be the, the period of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And there are some initiatives in, in this direction. I mean, uh, there are two uh, European citizens' initiatives uh, that are specifically dealing with uh, minority issues, uh, the Minority Safe Pack, which is basically on the track. I mean, uh, the, the, they had to postpone the, the public hearing in the European Parliament, but uh, this will take place probably later on in, uh, in, spring, in summer or in, in, uh, in autumn. And then there's uh, one specific initiative which uh, focuses on, on regions and um, uh, minority regions, basically. Uh, they didn't manage to, to, to collect the signatures, but the um, European Commission proposed um, uh, regulation to extend the deadlines for, for collecting of, of signatures. So we'll see how this will, will, uh, will go on. But uh, what we, we see is that um, I think uh, there's more and more kind of consensus that European Union must have developed its own standards. It's not anymore the 90s where or the, the other, where they, they simply relied on, on the standards of Council of Europe. And in fact, there is a need for upgrade because there are certain issues which are uh, new and uh, we, we have to find a solution for them as well. See, I mentioned uh, uh, technology. And I think we, we have to think very seriously on, on, on the issue of how technology impacts on minorities. Uh, think only about uh, the potential of discrimination based on algorithms, no? uh, apps or renting apps, which, which discriminate based on, on, uh, on ethnic background or, or surveillance uh, technology, the, the case of Uyghurs in, uh, in China is, is a kind of textbook example. And, and then the situation of Roma as well, no? I mean, uh, somebody asked the, the question about the Roma in, uh, in Europe. And I mean, there are certain uh, minorities like Roma, which due to their uh, socioeconomic standards are left behind. And if you think about how the education uh, uh, shut down during the crisis, and that the kids were told, okay, do uh, uh, online schooling from home. I mean, this basically left the whole community, Roma communities, uh, outside complete education system. This increased, I'm sure, the level of uh, dropouts 
among Roma, Roma, Roma children in an uh, impressive rate. So you see there are certain, um, I say, necessary upgrades of, of, of how and uh, how to deal with the minority issue. And I think uh, this is basically uh, our task for the future. Thanks. So, would you like to come in? On this multi-level thing and, and uh, the role of the European um, cooperation, I think what is interesting is that we, we face the same kind of problems in regions. For example, here in the Orland Islands, there is a huge debate about how many local authorities should there be, what should be their responsibility, how much should they pool their resources in things such as garbage management or, or uh, health issues or policy cooperation and so on. You have the same type of issue within uh, states where you, you need to uh, fine tune who is going to deal with the issue of dementia among the elderly in a situation of pandemic, for example, and there is a chaos in many countries. Uh, and there's, you have the same kind of issue then at the international level, but what we all know is that globalization affects all these different levels. Mm -hmm. So we are at the moment in a kind of a, a situation of a, a big debate needed about where should different subject matters be dealt with. Yeah where should we cooperate more closely and where should we leave more uh, lesions uh, for regions or for states or for whoever. So we're, at least in Europe, I feel very strongly in a major constitutional moment which has been pressurized ahead of time and which then will probably be dealt with under the chairmanship of, of Angela Merkel in, in, the, in the European context. So it's quite interesting that we then have a federal state leading this, um, this debate about the different levels. We don't know what it will be. What we do know though, is that we are also in the midst of a discussion between authoritarianism and democracy. Yes, we, we see the tendencies within Europe and outside Europe. And there are those who are saying that um, authoritarian regimes have been more effective in dealing with the pandemic. There is this infatuation of the strong, powerful center. And, and this authoritarian tendency is simply wrong because we still have to deal with other issues. Issues such as migration, the Greek border was closed forcefully to the migrants on the border when we speak of borders with the uh, uh, excuse of the pandemic in a cooperation between Turkey and Greece effectively. Um, uh, and and um, si similarly, we, we have to deal with migration, we have to deal with the ecological issues. And democracy is the best system we have until now for uh, balancing and prioritizing among different uh, cr crucial issues, rather than uh, giving priority to one or the other in, in, in a... Um, in a, in a non-debated issue. And for that reason, I would like to return to my initial point that bringing in parliaments more strongly in the debate about states of emergency and the debate about measures is necessary if we are going to um, develop these different ideas. And here in the Orland Islands, the, the local parliament has basically not discussed at all, just for, for a brief uh, information. I think you're making a very, very good point there, which also raises the issue of local involvement or even the involvement of the Euro regions in, uh, in, in tackling crises such as the, as, as the COVID-19 crisis. And by sort of, while I was listening to all three of you, I was looking at the questions that come in. Um, the most, the, the, the point that was raised by most um, commentators was a question, have there been any positives um, in this, in this COVID-19 crisis? Have there been any kind of local or regional cross-border initiatives, even across closed border initiatives in Europe and, and, and beyond that kind of give us a little bit of hope that uh, things might be sort of um, tackled in a different way should something like that occur? Could I ask you sort of for, for a brief answer on the question, have there been any positives about uh, sort of in, in closed 
um, local or regional cooperation, cross-border cooperation in the recent weeks? Would you know of any? Well, um, I was mentioning a few uh, related yes. to, you know, South Tyrol and, and uh, Tyrol and Austria. Um, perhaps the most important and most visible one I forgot, which is the fact that when the situation was extremely dire here, um, uh, some people have been hospitalized in, in Austria and even in Germany. Um, I mean, this is uh, certainly an example of, you know, good working uh, cross-border relations which uh, cannot be completely removed just by a, a moment of difficulty. So again, uh, my plea is to look at things in a broader perspective and then we see also uh, that uh, a number of positive aspects uh, do exist uh, alongside, unfortunately, a number of very, very negative uh, aspects. And again, let me go back to the issue of the, the Roma, which has been already mentioned. Yeah. Sergio, Sia, do you know of any examples? Well, I, I, can, I can just mention that um, also minority regions can offer, uh, even they may be uh, weak or, or poor or, or um, uh, very unimportant in many ways, uh, th there are um, people, we are called homo sapiens for a good reason. We are problem oriented as human beings. And that we really saw during the, the pandemic and we continue seeing how private and public um, actors come together in order to solve, um, for example, the production of health protective materials and exporting also outside their own region. There are many such examples. And people have created um, in the Faroe Islands, uh, turning a, a fish a virus uh, testing system into a COVID testing virus system mm -hmm. and being able to use that also outside um, the Faroe Islands. So there are very good examples, even from small actors. Uh, and, and overall, I think one should uh, agree with Francesco that there are huge problems, but things have basically worked. We can manage. Thank you so and, much. Yeah, so I'm, I'm on the positive side. Very good. That's, that's, that's how I want to end today, this webinar. That's, that's okay. Can I sort of wrap up by thanking the three of you, Sergio Constantine, co colleague of mine in, in the Minority Institute in the OERAC, Francesco Palermo from the um, um, Institute for Comparative Federalism in the OERAC, and Sia Spiliopoulou uh, Ockermark from the Ireland Islands Peace Institute. Thank you so much for your valuable contributions. Can I mention to everybody else that um, this was our, the third of our, our webinars. There will be another one next week, next Thursday, June the 4th from 3 to 4 p.m. And the title will be COVID-19 and Religious Minorities. Thank you very much for participating, posing interesting questions. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed Thank it as much you. as I did. Thank you so Thank much. You all the best. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.